Hey everybody, this is Phil Town. And this is Danielle Town. Uh, welcome to the Invested Podcast, where we are deep into Warren Buffett style investing, you guys. I think you probably figured that out by now. Yes. And we've been wandering around in the woods of really tiny businesses. Well, not well, like laundromat tiny, size. Yeah, exactly. Tiny businesses that went public. They went public. And tiny is relative, isn't it? Um, because yeah, tiny if you is very relative. one of these tiny businesses, you'd be a millionaire. Well, right? Conceivably. Conceivably. Well, no. If you own it and it's out Maybe in the market on paper. worth $10 million, yeah, yeah, you'd be an on paper millionaire. Um, but so here's my question that, that I've actually been wondering, like, since we started talking about it, and I just haven't, we've been like focused on stuff. So uh, my big question is why would a company go public without being listed on a major stock exchange? Why would any company want to be one of these slightly sketchy, maybe, or not, maybe amazing pink sheet? companies what's the point is it just to raise money Mm -hmm. they're they're out there raising money so what they do when they go public this is kind of interesting thing um we have the most vibrant active liquid humongous public market of any country in the world by far and what that means is that you have the benefit of um owning a business in the United States that you can relatively easily and relatively inexpensively go out and get more money, get money to run your company from investors all around the world um, by listing your company in one of the U S stock markets. Right. Um, Now to list the company, you go through a process with the securities exchange commission and the process can be very, um, expensive and time consuming to have a full listing in the public stocks. And you know about this because you're an attorney and did that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, and and the stock exchanges have a lot of requirements that they mm -hmm. are not, not necessarily regulatory. Maybe they are, maybe they aren't, but they have specific requirements in order to list a company and sort of put their print of approval, stamp of approval on those companies. Right. And strangely, one of those requirements usually is not that it actually makes money. No. (laughs) Nobody seems to care whether it makes money or not in terms of you can list it on my stock market. What they care about is how big it is in terms of what's called market capitalization. Or in other words, if you multiply the stock price once it's public times the number of shares, they want it to be pretty sizable. They want it to be ballpark $50 $50 million or so. And if yeah. it isn't 50 million, it's starting to get too small to be listed in their view. So no, none of the exchanges would want to list it if it's below that. They're a $50 million value company or what we call market capitalization company is so small. It's called a micro cap in terms of public stocks. So they have the smallest companies in public stocks are called micro caps. And then when they get bigger, they get up around 500 million. They're called small caps. And that goes up to about 2 billion. And then actually, I want to check that while I'm saying. Yeah, I I always forget where the lines are. There are lines, but frankly, Uh, I I couldn't really care. They're they're funny lines. Um, Yeah. And so the reason for that, the, the smallest, smallest still being, you know, very big is because of the liquidity of trading and these major stock exchanges want to make sure that they have enough shares to trade to make it one worth their while transaction cost wise, but also that they don't have, I would imagine that they don't have a stock that's making these gigantic leaps with very tiny buys and sells. Would you say that's right? Yeah. So I, I was close on the small cap thing. It's, it's 300 million to 2 billion not 500. So okay. figure 50 to 300 or is micro small cap 300 to 2 billion. And think about that. They're calling that a small company of mm-hmm. 2 billion dollars. <laughs> Holy criminy. So if you own the whole thing you'd be a billionaire and that's a small cap. And then mid cap stocks are are between 2 billion and 10 billion. Mm-hmm. Um 
and then large caps are 10 billion to 200 billion. And then I'm not really sure what they call the really big ones like Apple is a trillion dollar company, right? So here's here's the thing. They're just all large, Micro-caps, right? There's nothing above large, is there? Yeah, Terminology wise. Yeah. I don't think there is. I don't is. know what you call it. It's like super caps or something. Super large. Hyper large. Uh, super. Let's see. Mega caps. They're called mega. mega caps. Mega cap. Okay, there we go. So above 200 billion. So My favorite of piece of French slang from 20 years ago was hyper cool. So I say it whenever I can. What is it? Hyper cool. What, what, hyper you, cool oh, with a French accent. No, because I was cool. saying they're hype. They're heat. They're hyper, it, whatever. It was a deep. It was a deep cut. <laughs> <That's great. laughs> hyper cool so, is my favorite slang, though. So I guess one of the questions would be why? Why? Well, let's let's come back to the fact that you can raise money because that's pretty darn cool. You can get a company put together, and if it's has value out there of let's say a few million dollars, um. That is, somebody thinks it's worth a few million dollars. Like we said, you don't have to be actually having any profits. There's right. quite a lot of companies that go public without any profits at all, um, just based on speculation that it's going to be a very successful company in the future. Right. And they'll be happy to list it if there's a lot of people interested. I guess the part that, the way- that I find confusing is that, of course, they're doing it to raise money. That's why you do it. But the drawbacks are you're exposing your financials you're okay you're not required for like certain financial disclosures but you are in a sense just by demand of the market i would imagine if you don't put those financials out now people are wondering why you're putting yourself out for yourself being the company out for public scrutiny and it just doesn't seem to me that Unless you're really desperate for outside investment, and that being the one good reason, why would a company want to do that? And I just wonder if you have any other reasons that aren't coming to mind. Other than getting money? Yeah, but I mean, you pay for that. You, again, the company pays for that by uh, some knock to their reputation in a way. Like they're not fully well, listed. They're not on a stock exchange. They seem a little suspicious. Why are they over the counter? Why are they on the pink sheets? Are they putting out reliable financials? What's been happening to their stock price? Is it going up and down like crazy? Is it never moving? Because nobody ever buys or sells their stock. And then what does that mean? It just sort of seems to me like it would cause a lot of negative questions around yes, a company. All true. All true. So let's go through the process in general of how you get money for your company. Because let's say, let's say you start this, you know, the classic example of the lemonade stand, right? Yeah. Or even better. Let's say you start a, a, a hamburger place. Cool. Okay. I mean, sure. Yeah, anybody could start a hamburger place. So you start a hamburger place and it turns out people really like your hamburgers. Well, when you start off this hamburger place, you've got to fund it from something, right? You've got to, you've got to pay for the equipment to make hamburgers. You've got to pay a lease of a place. You've got to get a place people can come to. And you've got to hire employees. And usually you don't start off making a profit because there's almost nobody coming to your hamburger restaurant. Uh-huh. So you have to go for a little while putting out advertising and all of that costs you money. So these are called startup costs and they typically have to come out of your pocket. And if you don't have any money, but you really are a good cook, then you're going to have to get the money from somebody like your family or friends, right? will lend you money. No bank, a bank might lend you money. If you have a house, they can put a mortgage on. Yeah. Um, you might be able to get money that way. Or today you could maybe crowdfund the thing do a little Kickstarter campaign yep. and go out and raise some money like that. Right. But that's really small potatoes money. You're talking just enough to get started making hamburgers. Yeah. All right. So far. All right. Now it turns out that people love your stuff and they start to complain that there's no 
Danielle Berger up in their neck of the woods. They want a Danielle Berger up there where they are. And so you think, wow, here's a great opportunity. And my friend Bob is a really good restaurant manager and he would go manage that. So I want to open a second place. I need some more cash. So where am I going to get it? Well, you might go after someone who's already rich. I mean, you could come to me, except I'm your dad. But let's say you didn't, I wasn't your dad. You could come to me and say, I've, I heard that you are interested in funding new businesses as an angel investor. That's what I would be called in that case. Yeah. And you could show me your business plan and how well you're doing in your first restaurant. And I might be interested in funding the next stage of this thing. So that's another place you could get capital. Now, let's I mean, I understand on. they go public to get investment. Is well, that, here, I'm, this you're is getting not, there. They're not public yet. I'm getting there. Okay. So let's say that now you've got an angel investor who funds the first three restaurants and they're really going well. You could go to the next level of money availability of venture capital, which you know very well because you mm-hmm. worked as an attorney with and venture capitalists are not going to be interested in you with three restaurants. Right. But if you've got, let's say, 10 of them and it's really going well and they could put several million dollars into this and see that they could, this could be the next McDonald's, they would be very interested. Mm, and they could they give wouldn't, you several but million angel dollars. investors might be. Okay. The next Chipotle Mexican grill. When I mean, there wasn't a Chipotle Mexican grill. <laughs> if Something you're the app you to be able to buy Chipotle bur- uh, burritos uh, far more easily, then yes. Uh, okay, I got an attorney involved here. Okay, <laughs> so um, venture capital would be able to put millions in when an angel yeah. investor might only be able to put hundreds of thousands in, let's say. Correct. All right, and venture capital can put in millions to hundreds of millions. Mm-hmm. Hundreds of millions. Mm -hmm. So that is the range of available capital without going public. And there's quite a lot of money out there for for great companies to not go public. Mm -hmm. So why would you go to the expense of going public, to all of the scrutiny of going public? As you said, why would you do that? To raise well, money because you're not able to, you're not a high growth business and you're not able to get it from venture capital and you've already tapped out all of your bank resources, Bingo. friends and family. Yeah. Bingo. So, so basically when I said it seems little... desperate, it's because it is desperate. Yes. Okay. Or, it's, or, and it's even a little somewhat scammy. Okay. Because think about it. <laughs> think about it. This is a business that nobody else wants to put any money in. That's what I'm saying is that's the message that I get. And I was wondering if I'm like missing a nicer vibe than I should be getting. It's really, really true that companies that go listing on these, uh, on these pink sheets or they're listing in the Pacific stock exchange out of San Francisco, or I think it used to be the Vancouver stock exchange, but I think they, they stopped it. I don't know. You can tell me, but they, these very small exchanges super risky but they're also the potential to find that you know that nugget that gold nugget that's sitting there that that is actually a really good company and it Mm -hmm. actually could do very well but they don't have the resources to go through you know it's not a venture capital kind of a business they just don't really interested in it they don't know any angel investors their friends don't have enough money uh, they've already done two Kickstarter campaigns. They really can't get any more money that way. But it's actually a really good business. They, they know Yeah, and I doing. just want to explain just quickly like why venture capital or angels wouldn't necessarily be interested in a non, well, let's call it a slow growth business, a non high growth business. It's because they need to get a return within a few years, usually. A biggest, longest horizon would be 10 years. And with um, with high growth businesses, which are generally tech businesses, they get started, they either hit or they don't, and everybody can get a, an exit, a return on their money by selling their stock at a certain point. Um, they want to have that within within a certain number of years. And these sort of like slower businesses like restaurants, that's why I kind of wanted to just make it clear that a restaurant would not count in the venture capital category most likely is because they tend to be a slower growth business, stores, etc. 
and uh, and you just it's not that they're not good businesses. It's just a longer return. And um, while you're filling us in on that, a very absolute perfect reasoning. I have also discovered that I'm wrong about the Pacific Stock Exchange. <laughs> it shut down. Um, it got subsumed under the New York Stock Exchange and is basically online now. So oh, I didn't even know what you were talking about. So you were saying yeah. that there was like an exchange just for tiny pink slippy companies? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. Up in Vancouver, in so San it Francisco, failed. they had their own little building. <laughs> I think it, let's see, how did they end That's up getting rid of it? It's now an Equinox Fitness Center. <laughs> well, and they didn't make tons of money and are doing incredibly well. Uh, that's interesting. It's funny yeah. you hear these you hear these things every I hear these things every now and then about like a new market or a new exchange for something, like especially like secondary markets for privately held stock, something like that, and they just never quite work. Because, I mean, there's uh, uh, people have many opinions, but my personal opinion is that it's because they just don't have the regulatory standards, or not even regulatory, but the disclosure standards that um, are reliable enough for investors to really be able to trust them. And then I think, secondly, they're just too small. I mean, the same reasons we were talking about last time. They're too yeah, small for big funds and even for small funds usually. So and there's and there's just so much more risk. I mean just just the history of the stock market of the Pacific Exchange could tell us a lot about the Tell us level. the history. Interesting. Yeah, they got, they got uh, is this sold. straight from Wikipedia? Mhm. Okay. They got so <laughs> they got sold to the New York Stock Exchange, ARCA. So they they got subsumed as ARCA. They were re- originally the Archipelago Exchange. Uh, that took over from the Pacific Stock Exchange. Then they went to the New York Stock Exchange, and then they had a little problem. Um, there was a flash crash in 2010, and their thing. A lot of people think that maybe the ARCA Exchange had something to do with that. And then in 2017, Wait, what's a flash crash? Uh, the stock market dropped like 900 points in oh, one Oh, got it. Okay, I thought there was. And like then went a, right back up again. Yeah. Okay. Right, and so. In 2013, the like ARCA system failure or something. <laughs> it, it sent a whole bunch of sequences to NASDAQ that overloaded their information processor. Oh, no. And and that caused a chain effect, and that led to a flash crash, 2013, oh, very no. quick, but they fixed it. And then in 2017, the ARCA platform just stopped functioning. No. And they were unable to close training, uh, trading for some undetermined number of funds that were working through that. Yeah, like, that no oops. one will ever touch that again. Wow. No, no you're dead. That's so, scary. Uh, this is just an indication of, of how kind of edgy yeah. these little tiny things are, right? They're edgy all the way across the platform. They're edgy on the individual stocks. They're edgy at the brokers that trade them. I mean, these are not Goldman Sachs level right. stuff. And so there's kind of a quandary a little bit when you're, when you don't have a lot of money and you want to invest in and make a lot of money quickly, basically kind of like I did when I first got started, I made a lot of money pretty quickly. You're going to take some risk. I mean, there's just no doubt that's how you have to go if you're really going to do that. And so, um, you can be very patient. You can learn to do options trading, for example, which would be a much more controlled risk. You have to, or you could be very patient and wait for an opportunities and that could take years as you've seen listening to this podcast we've been years at this waiting for this market to finally organize reorganize itself um or you can start looking where the major number of investors don't look in particular where the big guys don't look mm-hmm. as we showed you last time you couldn't possibly even i in a, what amounts to a pretty small amount of capital wouldn't be able to it would take, what did we say, 500 days, 50, yeah. 60, yeah, that's what you said. 100 weeks, some ridiculous amount of time. If I doubled the amount of trading going on every day and somehow it didn't change the stock price, which it would, I would it would take me two years to get invested in that company if I bought an enormous amount of stock every single day. And 
in order to get enough into it that would be worth it for me. Mm-hmm. You imagine if somebody's got $10 billion, they just couldn't even begin to think about it. And if you look at somebody like Warren Buffett that's trading hundreds of billions of dollars, he said once that it was impossible for him to move in and out of companies quickly because that amount of money means you're not nimble anymore. Right, yes. Whereas he also said if he had only a million dollars, he said, he said I could something like I could probably make 50% a year. And then he paused and he said, no, I know I could. Yeah. 50% a year. And that would be because he's probably going to look where analysts are not following those companies and he's going to use his skill at understanding the business to pick companies that are going to be very successful. I think that's true. Yep. I would love, so, uh, maybe he's doing that for fun on the side. I wish I could. I would love it if he would do that. Oh, wouldn't that be fun? Like, oh my! God. I would just love would, a case study. Like, what would he pick out of some tiny little company? I mean, you know, maybe so, that is maybe so there are not companies that are up to his standards. That's the big question. I mean, that's what we've been talking about. Are these companies yeah. up to a Buffett standard? And I mean, what you well, basically said is almost all of them are probably not, but some might be. Yeah, and one of the problems is they may not have a very long track record as a company, right? They they might not have been around a number of years. Yeah. And one of the things that Warren has taught me is that I really want to be looking for a business that's been around long enough to go through a recession. And hmm. the way he puts it is, you know, we want to see 10 years of data. Well, up until just the last decade, 10 years of data always included a recession. Always. For 140 hmm. years, 10 hmm. years of data would give you a recession. So it's only the last 13 years where that hasn't happened. So in general, you're going to want to see this through a recession. Well, I mean, we do get to see the pandemic influence, right? That was too quick. You think that was too quick? Yeah. Well, uh, no, you know what? I think it's instructive. It's a really good point. That, that would be, that would be a time period where if you were leveraged, yeah, you could have real problems. Yeah. It showed supply chain problems. It showed, international problems. problems it showed communication yeah. problems it showed the ability That's to true. shift quickly or not i found it instructive okay. i mean I yes mean, it's not a true recession but yeah right right recessions typically last several months this lasted like f- several weeks before they poured so much money into the economy that it took us out of it and then it was just you know if you can't get your stuff which would not be a normal business problem in a recession um, well, you know, or if you're, that's, you know, office real estate, <laughs> that showed a few problems yeah, in that industry, true. didn't it? Yeah. But generally speaking, we want to see that the tide goes out. What happens to this company? Right. Because Warren, again, quips that, you know, when you, when the tide goes out, you get you get to see who's been swimming naked. And what he means by that is who, who what companies out there have overextended themselves in such in ways that you might not perceive hmm. Um, hmm. Uh, on on just short term numbers, which is what you're so saying about the, the debt problems. load. Yeah, yeah, that's one of the problems of of a new company that's out there with a, a pink sheet listing. Um, yeah, you may not be able to see enough time where this thing has really gone through a bad bump in the economy. So good companies will come out of a recession stronger than they went in. And bad companies may not come out of it at all. They may go bankrupt. Or would you come out of it weaker? Would you say then that meeting all the standards? I'm gonna assume you're gonna say meeting all the standards of a stock exchange listed company is mm. just as important for a pink sheet company. Yes. Well, all except the amount per share. No, no. I just right. meant like for our checklist that we go through as mm-hmm. invested role one investors. Yeah. Um, I would say the fact that they don't have to have those, the level of auditing yeah. that goes on. So that's my next company. question is, are there any factors in which you actually would put a higher standard than what we typically might want? Like maybe the debt, the short term debt here, I was what I'm taking away from this. Good, good point. Um, being comfortable with three years of debt the way I am, like typically, yeah. we'll, we'll say that if a company has 
free cash flow that can pay off debt in three years or earnings pay off debt in three years. We're pretty comfortable with that at a kind of at a maximum. But I would probably rethink that on a on a very small company and really try to understand why. Why are they putting that debt on there? Mm -hmm. Right. What what are they doing? Because here's the thing. If a company is growing, this company is a new stage company and they're really a potentially great company. They may be adding a lot of debt. They may not have earnings. That's what I was going to say. Uh, they might have right? much more debt. I mean, the the likelihood is that they have more debt than yeah. And so, a, a honestly, you higher probably, growth company. In order to invest in that kind of a company, you rather than tightening your standard, you probably have to loosen it in terms of just what the computer would see, the ratio between earnings and free cash flow. They may not have any earnings at all, and they have debt. So you, you don't have three <laughs> years of earnings. To pay off the debt, you don't have any earnings at all. Well, why would you loosen so, your standard? Because it, if the com because you know that the you know the business well enough to understand what they're doing and that they're going to be successful at it. Hmm. So let's say it's McDonald's. That sounds like a risky biz thing to me. Oh, he, well, yes and no. In other okay. words, yes, if you really like this business, but understand that there are issues that could definitely prevent them from being successful. Yeah. Risky biz portfolio. If on the other hand, let's say this is Chipotle Mexican grill and it is unique. It's fantastic. People are lining up. They, they can't build them fast enough. And so they're funding out of cash flow. They um, are writing off a lot of expansion they they may have numbers that don't look good. Actually, I'm sort of thinking Chipotle probably would have numbers that look pretty Wait, good. Wait, are you saying right that if it's like that, but it's a $10 million tiny company? Or are you oh, talking yeah, 10 about- 10 or 20 or 30 million. Okay. Yeah. I mean, what's one, what's one fast food place worth, right? Just one. A um, million dollars maybe? Sure. Okay. And you've got 10 of them. So your ten million dollar company, yeah, yeah, that could be a Chipotle at the early stages for sure, for sure. So and then, so here go, they wow. are. They've gone public to raise money. They're mm -hmm. a um, great little organic burger place. Mm -hmm. And burritos, yeah, what burritos or burgers oh it. i don't know i was thinking about this particular place yeah, in boulder that i really like that i would totally oh, okay, invest cool. in that i can't remember the name of oh, but they had some multiple they had several restaurants what were they called anyway sorry guys yeah, i mean there's really a annoying. five guys running um, around out there but they're, they're private i think oh Maybe five guys has public? tons of restaurants but that's a whole other these. thing that's yes no totally um and the thing is, okay, so let's say like, you're right, this is a good example. So you, we eat there, we love it, it's so good, there's lines, people are super into it, they're excited to grow, they're growing, and they've got a lot of debt to do that. Yeah, that's a great example. So to me, that is a, okay, I'm buying it through the public market, so this isn't quite right, but to me, that is an angel investment. It's an early company. I don't know how it's actually going to work out. They haven't proven themselves, but the idea is great. The people are great. The moat is great. Nobody else is doing it, et cetera, et cetera. I don't, I don't know how that goes into the main portfolio. To me, that's like risky biz. It has to be. But if I have a small amount of money, which is happening, then maybe you have to just use, I don't know. Oh, I hate breaking rules. But you get what I'm saying. <laughs> don't break them. Let's stay with the same rules. But here's the thing. Let's say, let's say that you were building a company called Shake Shack. Sure. I mean, that's a company, right? That's public. That's is, a great it, stock, yeah. by the way. It is? Yeah. Shake Shack. Shake Shack. I don't think so. Yeah, it's public. It's owned I mean, by um it's that guy who started uh oh my god, I can't think of any names of restaurants right now. The, he owned that's restaurant in Madison it's Square Park. Daniel somebody? Danny yeah. something. 
Yeah. Boy, boy. Anyway. Daniel um, Meyer. Danny Meyer. Yeah. He Daniel also Meyer. started Danny Union Meyer. Square Grill. Like he's an incredible restaurateur in New York. And he started Shake Shack in the park with that one little shack. How, did I ever take you there? No. It's great. No. So the original Shake Shack is in um, Madison Square Park. And it's literally a little shack in the park. And then he developed it into a restaurant. And now it's in airports. It's in LaGuardia. It's in, um, it's probably in LaGuardia too, but it's definitely in JFK. And it always weirds me out every time I see it. Well, let's, let's say that you knew him and he was looking for some money and he decided he was going to go pink sheets. It's not what he did, but let's say he did that. He mm -hmm. would list this company early and let's say you could buy it when it was 50, 40, 30 million dollars of value. Mm -hmm. right. It wasn't profitable yet, but you could see this guy's going to make a home run out of this. Okay. He went public at one, almost a billion dollars valuation. So here's, here's why people do this stuff at early stages is you, you buy into this when it's 50 million and he goes public at a billion, it's 20 to one you just made in probably five years. It's yeah. Just I mean, gigantic. His I mean, that would be, wasn't very let's, risky, let's calculate you now. Let's calculate the kager on this. It goes from 50 to a billion, which is 20 to one or a, what is that? 2000% return. But what is the compounded annual growth rate? If you did that in five years, what would it be? I love doing this kind of stuff. I will bore you to tears. I would go from 50 like to, to 100. I like to just wait for you to give me the answer. 50 to 100, that's one double. 200, that's two doubles. 400 is three doubles. 800 is four doubles. And that's about where they went public. Four doubles in five years. So the rule of 72 is um, how many times can you, if you divide four, sorry, if you divide the number of years it Where'd took you get to go years? double once. I just made it up. Oh. <laughs> I just said it went from, you went from 50 million to a billion dollars. That's four doubles in five years. And that means you're doubling every year and uh, uh, almost just um, let's just call it once a year. You're doubling. That puts you at almost 100%, roughly 100% compounded annual growth rate for five yeah. years. So your dollar, whatever dollar you put into that, doubled almost five times. Doubled from a dollar to two dollars to four dollars to eight dollars to sixteen dollars to twenty dollars. So you went from one dollar to twenty dollars in five years. That's why people do this stuff. That's tremendously exciting. If you can, but that's spot, why people do what stuff? Put their money into an early stage pink sheet. But it wasn't a pink sheet company. So are you talking about Shake Shack, like in a hypothetical world where it was once yeah, a pink sheet hypo company? Totally okay, hypothetical. thank you, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Now, if you didn't buy it then, in the pink sheets, of course, it didn't exist there. But let's. That was hypothetical. Let's go to the real world. You could have bought Shake Shack with a pretty good amount of information behind it in about 2015 or so at $45 a share. And if you did that, you would have held on to it from 2015 to now, which is about eight years, and your rate of return would be almost zero. Yeah. So what happened with that company, if I remember right, is that because his reputation is so massively strong and because he built the company over, I don't know exactly, but his whole career. So let's say 20, 30 years privately when he decided to and I think he has like a PE, like a private equity company involved when he decided to really like try to push Shake Shack out as a chain brand outside of New York. Um, I think what happened is that he was able to go public at such a ridiculously high valuation because one, Shake Shack, that's fun. Everybody likes it. Mm -hmm. Buying Shake Shack is cool. And two, his reputation as a businessman preceded him and people really trusted the company. So it worked. But then... <laughs> You know, it's been rocky since then. So yeah, it's an interesting one. And that 
is the other problem with going after early stage companies that have gone public in the big markets is that you might be buying a company from the venture capitalist and the angel investors and the founder. Yeah. And they're essentially done pushing this thing up the mountain. I should, I should, I wish I remember. I want to say there might've been some scandal, like some harassment scandal. I want to say maybe at his company, maybe that was part of it too. I can't remember. So yeah, I think they've had some reputational difficulties and he is to my knowledge, no longer involved. So they're taking that brand and they're going forward with it. And I mean, the burgers are still good. So they're trying to make something good out of it. Right. Trying to make something good out of it. Got those airport locations with early stage stuff. So I I just think that early stage is fraught with risk. You're going to have to really know what you're looking at and what you're doing. And even when you do know what you're looking at, and even when it's really successful, you can't just sit back and be okay with it because it may be when it goes public and it looks like you're making a lot of money, everybody's getting out and knows what's going on. Well, and 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 that's where price is everything, right? Like it can be a great company, best company ever. And if you buy it at too high of a price, it's still not a good investment. So that's a great example of that situation. If you assume it's the best company ever. Yeah. So let's, we should wrap up. (laughs) Man, Um, I really want to go to Shake Shack now. Every time we talk about food companies, it just tortures me. We should talk about some Swiss food company. I'll tell you what, let's look at their stock when we come back next, next week. At Shake Shack? Sure. Yeah. Okay, cool. (laughs) Okay. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Time to go play. See ya. Hi, guys. Thanks for listening to Invested. If you enjoyed this episode and you want more information or to listen to additional episodes, visit our website at investedpodcast.com and sign up for my virtual workshop right there. Spots are definitely limited for this event. I'm not kidding. They really are. They sell out very quickly. So everything discussed on this podcast, by the way, is either my opinion or it's Danielle's opinion. And it's really important. It's not to be taken as investing advice because I am not your financial advisor, nor have I considered your personal situation as your fiduciary. So remember that. You're on your own here. This podcast is for your entertainment and education only, and I really hope you enjoyed it.